My spiritual journey began in earnest in 2007 when I suffered three major heart attacks in as many months, followed by open heart surgery and a triple bypass. On top of that heart problem, I had been depressed for more than two years, wallowing in self-pity after the sale of my company. What I did not appreciate at the time was that I had entered something John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul. Yes, I was physically ill, and the deep depression was certainly real. But what was really going on was a spiritual crisis. Physically, mentally, and spiritually, especially spiritually, I was broken. And at that moment of greatest brokenness, greatest pain and anguish, I came face to face with God. He had been there all along, patiently waiting for me to realize that it was I who was blind. I like the way Rumi said it in the 13th century. The wound is the place where the light enters you. Well, in the bright light of his presence, it only made sense to me to start talking. I asked God to grant me the grace to discover what he wanted me to do. I asked him for the strength to do it. Long before I realized that the ultimate destination was Rome, I embarked upon this passage of spiritual discovery. I felt a deep need to better understand what I call the five big issues. Life, death, love, pain, and God. Starting with the Bible, I read every book about faith and goodness that I could find. I engaged in long conversations with God. For the first time in my life, I listened more than I talked. Before I even learned what the words meant, I developed a daily practice of Lectio Divina. I read this wonderful passage from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So early in this transformative experience, long before a church, Catholicism or any other, became involved, I made the decision to fill my empty life container with what I discerned to be, using Paul's words, good and acceptable and perfect. I was 62 years old when I began the primary task of the second half of my life. That path has not been straight in my case. I often stumble, I slide backwards, my ego gets in the way, material comforts matter too much. But so far at least, each time I fall, I get back up and try again. I came to believe that God is a verb, not a noun. And the verb God is synonymous with love. In the first epistle of John, it says it clearly. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. I joined the board of a Jesuit organization, again, long before I pursued Catholicism or baptism. Because there were Jesuits, I read more books. I devoted myself to understanding the history of Christianity. The pastor of the Catholic Church my wife attended and I visited became my good friend and spiritual advisor. He once said to me that many of the things described in the Bible 
probably never happened, but that, that they're all true. I love that. He said the two most important words in the Catholic faith were forgiveness and inclusion. Forgiveness and inclusion. I love that too. Father John, my wife Sally Ann and I, all fell in love in the sense so beautifully described by Teilhard. Love alone is capable of uniting living beings in such a way as to complete and fulfill them. For it alone takes them and joins them by what is deepest in themselves. That's powerful. After two years of RCIA, during which I read more books, I was baptized. In the year after my baptism, I completed the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola, putting, of course, my own spin on Loyola's instructions. Instead of reflecting in silence on the daily reading, expanding my heart space to understand the content, instead of that, I read commentaries and listened to lectures about the history and meaning of each passage. I wrote a book about my experience, quoting extensively from that research. Then my wife and I traveled to Italy to listen to Richard Rohr and Cynthia Borgo talk about Franciscan mysticism. I tried to read every book they mentioned during that retreat. And of course, largely because of that introduction to this alternative orthodoxy, I entered the inaugural class of the Living School, which introduced me to the wonderful list of additional books we've all read and lectures we've listened to. But something was wrong, deeply wrong. My seven-year crash course in theology was simply not working. The more knowledge and information and data I put into my container, frankly, the emptier I felt. To a large extent, filling my container had become all about me. Worse than that, it was all a head trip. Even though my heart had broken, literally, I resisted God's words. I patched the wounds in my heart with love-resistant bandages and bibliographies. The Apostle Paul pointed to a resolution of this dilemma when speaking of Christ in the second chapter of Philippians. Rather, Paul says, Christ emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant. Emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant. Kenosis, the Greek term for the self-emptying of one's will, is also translated as self-emptying love. Literally, giving all of oneself to the Beloved. It took me a long time to learn that I can only fill my life container by giving its contents away to others. Frederick Bergner suggested a starting point for that giving with these beautiful words. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. It was in the search for this meeting place of gladness and hunger that inspired the formation of the Sister Parish Ministry. Almost a year before our first symposium in the Living School, several men from my Catholic parish in Ponte Vedra, Florida, began to discuss how we might serve others. Our parish vicar, Father Frank Iacona, suggested the idea of a sister parish ministry, about which, frankly, we knew nothing at all. We eventually obtained a handbook for sister parishes from the Catholic Relief Services. We chose the Dominican Republic as the location for our new effort, and we contacted the Jesuit Refugee Service in San Domingo. Father Mario Serrano suggested two possible parishes in the Dominican Republic with whom our parish might form an active partnership. 
Both Mario and that CRS handbook stressed a focus on relationships, not resources, on the mutuality and equality of the partnership. One of the Dominican parishes suggested by Mario is surrounded by bates, which are permanent villages that grew out of temporary labor camps built for Haitian men imported over the past century to work in the Dominican cane fields. The men eventually brought their wives and then they stayed beyond just the harvest season. Today there are somewhere between 400,000 and 500,000 Haitians living in approximately 500 different bates throughout the Dominican Republic. Bate residents live in absolutely deplorable conditions, in dirt-floored barracks or huts, with leaking zinc roofs and rotting walls. In many parts of the country, including the area around the Bate where we are working, the sugar mills have closed, leaving the Bate residents with no work. Worse yet, the policy of the Dominican government is that these people simply have no legal existence. They are non-persons in the eyes of the government, constantly living with the threat of deportation. Our first mission took place in the week before that September 2013 symposium where we were all introduced as the first class of a living school. Quite unexpectedly, that first mission was, in most respects, a roaring success. 35 men and women from Ponte Vedra built houses, counseled teenage girls expecting their first babies, and treated numerous patients. The ministry was officially, formally, and solidly launched. There was one sour note from that first mission which came up at a follow-up meeting. The question was asked for each of us to name the one person we met in the Bate, thus one Haitian person, that most touched us. Sadly, after that first mission, not one of us could remember a single name of a person we'd met at the Bate. Well, we learned from that experience. We focus all missions subsequent to that first one on listening to the personal stories of the people we serve and doing our best to form lasting relationships. The ministry continued to grow over the fall and winter of 2013. A medical mission kicked off 2014. Numerous exploratory trips to plan a community center took place in the spring of 2014. I found myself reading less and with less enthusiasm. I tried to keep up with our living school assignments, but it was difficult. Sister Parish activities generally took precedence over everything in my life, including living school assignments. In 2014, we completed more than a dozen missions. We treated a thousand patients. We built a chapel, a school, an infirmary, a water treatment facility. More than 300 parishioners from Florida touched the lives of close to 2,000 Haitians and Dominicans, forming relationships, real relationships, with several hundred of them. Six different missions have already been completed in the first six months, 2015. The medical team is now seeing patients for the fourth and fifth time. The youth groups and family missions, after completing the community center, combine housing construction with counseling and, incredibly, meditation groups. On a personal level, Sister Parish awakens me each morning and stays at the front of my mind as I fall asleep each night. My life container is filling faster than I can empty it, even as I return with greater frequency to the Dominican Republic and give more of myself with each visit. Paraphrasing Buchner just a little, my deep hunger met the deep hunger of the Bate. And it is at that meeting place that I most experience the deep gladness of God's presence.